Good morning, everyone. This is Pastor Matt Stokes from Coastal Christian, and I'm here with you to join together for the morning meditation. And I am also with my ministry companion, Jesse Stokes. <coughs> hey, hey. He's got a little bit of a cough, but he's just fine. And uh, we would love to be with you in Psalm 2. So if you want to turn there in your Bible... We'll get started, and Jesse will pray for us. Psalm 2 is a very unique psalm. It is a psalm that we believe is written by David, even though it doesn't say it's written by David here. It's referred to in Acts as written by David, so we're very certain that he is the author. Interestingly enough, Acts chapter 2 is also referred to in Hebrews chapter 1, I think, when it's talking about the supremacy of Christ. And that he's begotten of the Father. That's right. This is my son. That's right. Um, maybe you'll look that up first. I know that's true. I just can't recall the verse yeah. this morning. But how about just um, you pray for us as we begin. Yeah. And uh, we'll go into a Friday morning meditation. Okay. Father, we just thank you for your goodness this morning. Thank you thank for you, the opportunity to study your word. Lord, we pray a blessing upon it that you would breathe upon it, Lord, that every word of God proves true. Mm. And Lord, thank you that we get to enter into your truth this morning in a world thank of you, lies, Lord. Lord. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. So Lord, help us renew our mind back to what's really true and important and lovely and amazing, Lord, in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. Thanks, Jess. So we only did two verses yesterday. My Bible actually ends this page with two verses. And we'll see if we can go further than that today. But it started out by the, the psalmist asking sort of a question that was just ridiculous and mind-blowing to him. He says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? So this is a rhetorical question. He's not really wondering why. He's saying, this does not make any sense. This is a meaningless mutiny in which these people are engaging uh, because they're raging against the king. And you see that? It says the heathen rage and they imagine a vain thing. Um, so they say to themselves, along with the, look at this verse too, the kings of the earth, they uh, the, uh, set themselves and the rulers take counsel. So not only do you have the people and the heathen people in the nations of the world, they're raging and imagining things. But now you have the major influencers of the world, the authorities of the world. And they're not just they're they're not just raging with empty imaginations. It says that they've set themselves. They've planted themselves firmly. You know, that's the idea of to set, you know, to establish themselves. And these authorities, they're taking counsel together. They've actually gathered together. Someone, I think it was Diane, said yesterday that it, it reminded her of the Tower of Babel, Jess. Mm. You know, yeah. what a perfect illustration that is. And also you see the same thing, I guess, in Revelation. Would that be, you think that's 19? About what? When, when the kings of the earth gather together oh, against yeah. the Lord yeah. at the Battle of Armageddon. That's 19. 19. So that would be an interesting place for you to, to continue this meditation if you want to look a little further on. Where do you think uh, Tower of Babel is? 11? Genesis 11. 11. So Genesis 11, Revelation 19 are some places that you might want to look to pick up on this idea that's happening in verses 1 and 2, where the people are, are raging and imagining a vain thing. The kings and the rulers, they've set themselves and they take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed. In the Hebrew, that means the chosen one. So in, in the ancient scriptures, there were several people that were chosen. Um, the priests were chosen for the ministry in the temple. The king was chosen to, to be the ruler of the nation. And the idea, the same thing as the anointed one. When, when a person was anointed, they were anointed for a particular um, destiny, whether it was the priesthood or kingship and royalty. And so this has a double meaning. It can certainly be related to David as the king of Israel. But it says against the Lord, that's Yahweh, and his chosen one, which ultimately takes its fullness in Jesus Christ. Um, um, 
And uh, what's really interesting is, again, Christ is always mentioning that uh, and connecting his relationship to his father. John chapter 5, when he says, my father is always working and because my father works, I work. What he thinks is what I'm thinking. Um, don't let your heart be troubled if you believe in God. Watch this. Believe also in me. Believe also in me. Right. Um, so there's this connection that he's constantly making to the father. I think John uh, chapter 10 as well. So let's pick up here in verse three. This is what this is what the people are saying. Now we get a, a clue into what it is they're doing as they take counsel together and they say this. Let us just can you read verse three for us? Let us break their bands asunder, and cast away their cords from us. Yeah. So it, so he says, let us all right. Let us break their bands asunder and their cords. Interesting, it's plural. This isn't just God. It's the Father and the Son that they're talking about in verse 2. And their sacred collaboration, their holy handiwork, their combined royal declaration of their kingship is being um, attempted to be confounded. Let us break their bands and let us cast away their cast away their cords. Uh, what, what impression do you get, Jess, when you picture the idea of casting away their cords? Uh, break free from any restraint. Like, okay. uh, I think of um, handcuffs. Yeah. Yeah. I think cords is a word that's used in the King James um, when it was referring to Samson. It says that they bound him with cords. Okay. You know, but I also think, and, you know, this isn't the exact translation, but it's an interesting application. I think of like a ship at a dock that you use the cords to wrap the ship up in order to keep it at the dock at the harbor. Yeah. And that picture of, you know, many times I've help somebody just unwind that from the piling and throw it back onto the ship so the ship can then drift away or float away and go in its own direction. And that's what they want to do in this particular situation. Let us break their bands, plural. And, and you know, that seems to be just the modern day atheistic view of God is that he wants to keep us bound. Yeah. That he is a, he is a, that, that, that the God and creator of the universe is a bondage bringer. Um, but the truth is, is that God is a bondage breaker. And so that's why I was calling this passage meaningless mutiny, because that is spiritual insanity to think that God actually is keeping us under bondage. He loves us and he wants to set us free, right? But in order to set us free, there are certain things that have to happen and certain ways in which our freedom is actually, how do I say it, Jess? Like I'm trying to say that our our whatever confines that we're put in through Christ is actually so that we can really live. You have any thoughts on that? Well, I just keep thinking about submission, mm -hmm. like submitting to Jesus is freedom. Right. What's that Bob Dylan song? You got to serve someone. Right. Yeah. Everyone's serving something. And, you know, I've actually been looking at the word slave in the Bible and how Paul calls himself a slave of Christ. And so the slavery to Christ is actually freedom because we have a good master. Mm. So. Mm. Yeah. So does God, does God really put his bondage on humanity? I remember my old pastor. I remember the first time I heard him say that it's life isn't about being set free. It's about finding the right master. And that's what Jesse's saying too, right? Because everybody serves something. You either serve your own flesh, your own carnality, your own proclivities, or you serve the, the, the Savior for all eternity, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's, uh, you know, it, and Jesus said, What? If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus said, Come unto me for my yoke, watch us. It's easy. It's easy. And my burden is light. And my burden is light, right? So the yoke, of course, most of us know, is that harness that goes over the top of two oxen when they're plowing through a field. And he's trying to say that the yoke that I would put upon you is easy and it's light. You know, he's talking about in Old Testament, 
um, particularly in biblical times, a rabbi's teaching was called his yoke. It was his way of life. It was his it was his rock solid routine that he had with God. And so many of the Pharisees and religious leaders, they had these routines that were extremely rigid and confining and constricting and full of legalism and rules and regulations that were not really scriptural but yeah. tried to make you look more spiritual and then jesus comes along and he says if you're weary from all of that and you're heavy laden come unto me because my yoke if you come under it it's easy and my burden if you yeah. want to consider it a burden is light right how beautiful is that um so then we get to verse four let us break the bands asunder. Let us cast away the cords from us. Now you'll see in verse 4, this is the Lord's response. What does it say, Jess? Can you read verse 4 for us? He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Okay. So something really powerful happens here in verse 4. It says, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. All right. So one thing I really want you to see here is, what's that first phrase in verse 4, Jess? Um... He that sitteth in the heavens. Right. He that sitteth in the heavens. Let's get one thing really, really clear right now. And that is that God is sitting in the heavens. Right? God is not, it doesn't say that God is sitting in the heavens and pacing. It doesn't say that God is standing in the heavens. It doesn't say that God is wringing his hands in the heavens. It says that he's sitting in the heavens. And there's a reason that when the psalmist wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he put him in a particular posture. King. Yeah, and his posture, right, Jess, is that of a king. Very good. And he's sitting on his throne. And he's sitting in the heavens. And it says that he's laughing. And what, Jess? He'll laugh and what? The Lord shall have them in derision. Right. And so, and he's laughing. So notice that the posture of him is that he's seated. And what's coming forth from him is laughter. It doesn't say that he's sitting in heavens and afraid. No. It doesn't say he's sitting in heaven and confused. It doesn't say he's sitting in heaven and concerned. It doesn't say he's sitting in heaven and he's worried. He's sitting in the heavens and he's laughing. And, and notice this, his laughter. Please understand this when you read it. Because if, if you misunderstand this, you're going to misunderstand something about the heart of God. He's not laughing at the sinfulness of man. He's not laughing at the brokenness of humanity. He's not laughing at the pain in this world. Um, he, he's not l laughing at the lostness of people. He's laughing at the proud rebelliousness. He's laughing at the insanity of the rejecting, rebelling people that have set themselves against God and against his anointed, which ultimately is Christ. So you have to see what that looks like. In my, um, and it says, the Lord shall have them in his derision. If you don't know what derision is in the King James, I'm not sure what it is in another translation, but it, literally the word derision has the idea of um, ridicule or contempt. Um, I get the picture, Jess, of this. He'll, he'll, he'll laugh and have them in his derision. Have you ever seen like a cartoon where like there's some, like some guy is like trying to fight this other guy and he's so little and the other guy's so big and the guy just sticks his hand out and puts it right on his forehead and the little guy's swinging at him and his arms don't even reach. Yep. And the big guy's just kind of laughing. Yep. And he's like, come on, are you kidding me? Like, you know, and the other guy's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's the picture I get when I see the enormity, infinite enormity of God and this little person that's just trying to swing and he's making no progress at all. That, that the Lord sits in the heaven. Just picture God sitting and doing that. He's not even standing. He's sitting and he's laughing and he's saying, come on, are you serious? Are you serious, right? As if, as if just verse one, that more people are going to make a difference. Oh, hey, like God's going to go, oh my gosh, it's not 10 people. They got a hundred thousand people. They've got a million people. Like that makes a difference to the one who flung the cosmos and every star in the universe into its place. Like he, like, like a hundred thousand or a million people are going to make a difference, even the whole world. Or God's like, oh no, they got some really influential people. 
They got some authority figures. That makes nothing, it, that does nothing to the God of the universe. Yeah. Um, so, where do we go from here? He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. He shall have them in his derision. So, so look at this. Um, I'm going to, let me see if I have a, look at the actions here. Okay. It says, let's see. It says, he that sitteth, okay, that's one action is that he's sitting. He shall laugh, and the Lord shall, he shall have them, all right, that's an action, in, in derision. So hopefully you can see what that posture looks like. Maybe we'll go one more verse. You ready? We'll turn the page and we'll go one more verse on that. Jess, do you have anything else on those two or that three and four before Tracy we... Tracy commented um, that the NLT translated scoffs at them. Yeah. That was interesting. Yeah, like <laughs> seriously, yeah. right? So yeah, that's a scoffing. That would be a, a good synonym too for the the picture that's being, that's being painted here. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Tracy. So I'm going to move this down. Just hopefully tell me if this is in the uh, scope of vision for everyone. Yeah, you got it. All right. And it says, then, oh gosh, man, that's a then. He shall what, Jess? Speak unto them in his wrath. All right. So I'm going to use that pink again. He shall speak unto them in his wrath and what? Vex them in his sore displeasure. All right. So now he speaks and then he's going to vex them. So he sitteth. He laughs, he's having them, he's possessing them, he's speaking, and then he's vexing them. So what I really think is interesting here, if we're, you know, again, the morning meditation, we're just like contemplating this concept. And that is in verse five, it says that he shall speak. He shall speak unto them. So look, the one that sits in the heavens is laughing, but now he's speaking. And I look at that and I think after laughing, God is speaking. Like I want to get all, you know, Zen on you, but think about this. After laughing, he's speaking. How much grace is that? How much mercy is that? Because another person would probably just uh, obliterate the other individual, destroy the other army, right? But that's not what happens. The first thing he does is he speaks to them. And there's, a, you know, a warning that he gives to them. He resets the playing field with his words. And I just think, I'm going to draw a line off of that word speak. And I'm just going to write grace yeah. and mercy. Because that's what God has that he even chose to speak to us. And what does God do? He sends his apostles. He sends his prophets to speak throughout the scriptures. And then finally he sends who, Jess? The son. He sends the very son, which is what we're going to look at when we go further into this chapter. But let's look at verse 5 here. It says that he speaks to them. Aren't you glad, as you're, we're joining together this morning, aren't you glad that God spoke to you first before judging you? Spoke to you first before just obliterating you. Spoke to you before annihilating you. Spoke to you before banishing you from his presence. The first thing he did is he spoke to you through the power of his Holy Spirit about the love of his son. That is the grace of God. That is the mercy of God. And that's what the book of Hebrews is saying too, right, Jess? Yeah. you have any thoughts about the book of Hebrews in that opening chapter? So I, I put it in the comments. Okay. Um, <coughs> it's Hebrews 1.5. Basically, um, the author of Hebrews is making the argument that um, Jesus is greater than angels. And he says, to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you? Mm -hmm. And so basically... Um, you know, author saying that Jesus um, is called a son. Mm -hmm. so he can't be an angel because he's a son, mm -hmm. and he's begotten, meaning um, you know, made. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's kind of confusing because Jesus was never created, but um, he's you know, Jesus, uh, the source of Jesus. He comes from forth from the Father. Yeah, he comes forth from the Father. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Okay, great. And we'll get down to begotten, hopefully, God willing, next time we're together. But yeah, good point, Jess. So thanks for bringing that up. 
we'll, we'll finish the idea that's here in verse 5. I just want to define this other word. After it says he speaks to them in his wrath, he doesn't just hit them with his wrath, annihilate them with his wrath. He speaks to them first. And it says, and vex them in his sore displeasure, right? So vex, if you don't know that word in the King James, there's a, there's a number one there. So I'm going to come down here and look into my study notes and find verse 5 and see if it gives us with it. It says distress. He'll distress them, right? So that's what the word that's what the word vex means. Vex means to to trouble someone. If someone in in the Psalms and other places it says a person is vexed in their spirit, yeah. it means they're troubled in their spirit yeah. or they're disturbed. Another word the King James might use is compounded. I would say it's this, and I haven't looked up the Hebrew um, recently to give you the Hebrew word, but I can say it's a word that kind of compounds to mean puzzlement and frustrated together. A frustrated puzzlement, right? So, you know, I'd probably if I lifted up the hood of a car and I saw that I had to take the engine out and put it back in, that would vex me. Right? Because I just, I'm puzzled and frustrated. My car's not working and I've got to stop the, the, you know, the, I got to take them off the motor mounts and look at the rack and pinion. Like, I don't know these things. So I would be vexed if Jesse said, Dad, how you doing? I'd be like, Jess, I'm vexed in my spirit right now. Like that. So he's saying emotionally, spiritually, maybe even mentally, socio, emotionally, relationally, physically, they are vexed by what God has done because he's about to say something that's going to like reset their thinking and cause them to have to recalibrate what it is that they're doing. And we'll look at that next time we're together where he says, you know, he vexed them. And this is what he said that vexed them. He spoke and he gave them this extreme frustrated and puzzlement by saying that he has a king. And the Lord has set his king upon um, my holy hill, right? He says, yet I have set my king upon my holy hill. Wow. Um, my king. Yeah. We'll, we'll get into this later, but yeah, I think, okay. yeah, yeah. Let's finish up this here with your thought. The second time where it says this is happening, but right. So go back to the yep. beginning. Yep. I forget where it is, but. Yeah, well, the first first four where it says, he that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh, the but is implied there, right? So they're like, let us break the bands and cast away the cords from us. It's like, but yeah, he yeah, that yeah. sits in the heaven so shall laugh. Like, this is happening, and then it's the reminder of the position of God, the God's perspective. So right. it's like Earth's perspective, then God's perspective, right? All right? Isn't that a good way to look at it? Yeah. So it's like this craziness. People are planning to overthrow God and overthrow, you know, be, become God, like the Tower of Babel. Like they're just, you know, raging against the Lord. But, yeah. but God sits in heaven and He laughs. So right. Go back to, to this part. Yeah. And then, you know, it says, um, Yet I've set my king. Um, yeah. You know, yet. They're, they're being confused and God's speaking to them. But, you know, all this craziness. I've set my king upon my holy hill. Right. Like, it's just a reminder from God's perspective, everything's in control and peaceful while chaos it's very similar to psalm 46 where it says you know right the earth is raging and people right. are in war and it says be still and know that i'm god right. i will be exalted among the earth right. i will be exalted god's in the midst of her she won't be moved right god will help her when her morning dawn so it's just it's just cool that's beautiful yes yeah, psalm 46 would be a great i'm gonna put that in this in the margin because that's a good uh, cross reference if you guys I don't know what your day holds but if you want to go read Psalm 46 mm -hmm. which you know is the one that says uh, he breaks the he breaks the bow he cuts the spear in two he burns the chariot in the fire and then it just gets still and he says be still like stand in awesome reverential like flatness on your face just like still before me and know that I am God um, because he's just so powerful. That's what he's hoping is going to happen with the rebellious. Yeah. That's what he wants to happen with the rebellious. Be still. So many of us have seen be still and know. And we think that it means when you're anxious, um, like be still. He's really talking to the world and he's saying like, hey, like I want you to just be in shock and awe of how infinitely powerful I am. Like the stillness is like a fear of God stillness that's happening there, you know. Um, Tonight is uh, 
tonight is the bonfire for the men. And I hope that you guys would invite all of your husbands to, to be there. Marjorie, I would hope that you'd be able to, I saw your name go by. I hope you'd be able to be there. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm thinking about what to speak on Jess. And I was thinking about Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the fiery furnace and how Nebuchadnezzar, when he saw them in the fiery furnace, but they didn't burn. I mean, he must have, he was so shocked yeah. and awed, right? Yeah. And then he, he repented in that moment and declared that, that their God was the God to be worshipped. And I'm just saying, that's what the heart of the Father is longing for in every sinner, is that they would be so shocked and awed by their own sin and by the power and judgment and justice and wrath of God. But yet he sent his Son to deliver us and to rescue us from all of that wrath and judgment, that that should just leave us in a place where if we truly comprehend that, we bow our knees to the maker of heaven and earth who loves us enough to send his only son to pay that debt and rescue us from that wrath, from that vexation, from being smashed like a potter's vessel, which is what we'll talk about next time we're together. So any other thoughts, Jess, before we wrap it up for today? Um, not necessarily, no. Okay. Just, uh, you know Revelation 19, you mentioned yeah. the Battle of Armageddon. For those who may not know what that means, I think most of us do. But Jesus is going to win in the end, and he's going to fight that final battle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, Isaiah 40 is cool, too. It talks about how the nations are like a drop in a bucket, mm. and all the princes of the earth are as nothing before him. Mm. And it's just like we look at, you know, this can apply today. I think we look at this war in Israel. We look at, um, you know, the LGBTQ uh, agenda, and we look at, you know, abortion and, and all these things mm -hmm. that we see. It's like, man, what is happening to our society? Mm -hmm. What is happening to America? What is happening in the world? Um, he who sits in heaven's laughs. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he's in control. He's going to win in the end. So, yeah. Um, don't fear. Don't fear what you see on the news. Don't don't run and hide. We we are called to stand strong and be bold. And r the righteous are as bold as a lion. Mm -hmm. And now's the time to shine. Uh, looking at what we see in the end times. So, yeah. It's great, Jess. Really great. A lot to think about there. So would you pray for us as we close it out today? Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. So God, thank you that you are in the midst of us, Lord. You're a very present help in trouble, Lord. Yes, you and are. I pray, God, that you would um, just allow us to um, look to you uh, and not fear um, the enemies of the Lord, mm -hmm. knowing, God, that you will reward the righteous and um, you will punish the wicked, Lord. You are just. And help us, Lord, to know Jesus deeper, Lord. Thank mm -hmm. you for dying on the cross for our sins. Thank you for rising again, granting us this gift of salvation. Lord. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jess. So, hey, we always say if this was helpful to you, you can share it. And please do share it. If it's really helpful, invite some people to come with you to Coastal. Coastal Christian meets at 22 West Dolls Avenue School in Summers Point. And we would love to have you with us. Um, this evening is the men's bonfire. If you needed to have any more details about that, you can go to www.coastalchristian.com. Uh, maybe one of you can put that in the website, the link, www, got to use the three W's, dot coastalchristian.com, and you can get the details for the bonfire. Um, we'll do some worship. I'm going to give a message, probably has something to do with fire, <laughs> so that we can stay warm thinking about the fire. And it looks like the weather's breaking, Jess, so uh, hopefully we'll have good weather tonight, yeah. and uh, we'll I see a lot of men. That first thing I woke up. Really? Yeah, I felt led to pray that. Yeah, we went to bed last night to some rain, but then we woke up today to it looks like the concrete's drying. So we'll see how if it holds off to tonight. And we look forward to seeing you there. Jesse and I might come back sometime tomorrow to talk about what we're going to be doing on Sunday morning, which is Second Peter chapter 1 and how he talks about the ministry of remembrance and constantly coming back to the essentials. And so if there's someone that you haven't brought to church, de-churched, far from God, in need of forgiveness, this will be a great Sunday to bring them to hear the essence of the gospel. So look forward to that. And uh, if we come on tomorrow, we definitely look forward to seeing you. There. Have a great day.